So thank you very much once again. Um, I, I bet this isn't a talk you're expecting. So I hope to at least, uh, uh, maybe may a bit of a downer, but at least you'll learn something from it. Uh, in the DevCon in, uh, in Japan, um, I suggested that the issues, once we start to have currencies with interest, that we could have debt with interest, that you get runaway wealth inequality. And historically, according to David Graeber and Michael Hudson, it leads to civil wars. Um, so we needed some mechanism to have uh, jubilees or other mechanisms of doing debt relief, um, or things can go very wrong. Okay, so I'm going to give another kind of... Uh, uh, thing to worry about um, that I hope is going to be at least useful uh, uh, to you uh, on a going forward basis. And it revolves around the term digital ownership of what is digital ownership, how it's being manipulated, what are the risks, what are the large corporations trying to do about it, uh, and the like. But before I get on a downer, let's just, I, I wanted to say thank you all for, for moving Ethereum to proof of stake. I mean, what an enormous achievement, and thank you very much. And I actually moved all of my personal Bitcoin to Ethereum because of this just in the last while. So thank you all. Um, it's really wonderful to see this whole ecosystem take steps forward in the way that uh, you guys have, have brought it forward. Okay, um, publisher's denial of digital ownership versus uh, the decentralized web, which is the uh, work the Internet Archive has been doing. So what does it mean when the mega publishers, four mega publishers sued the Internet Archive um, uh, about trying to have digital ownership of scanned books? Um, and this is, I'd say, a widespread um, uh, precursor of things you'll see in other areas. So in the nation, they wrote it up as actually above just the Internet Archive. It's taking the Internet to court. That the concept of what it means to have files, be able to archive them, be able to have use of them, be able to have them on your hard drives, is coming under attack uh, from these extremely large uh, organizations. And they're doing it in the guise of a lawsuit against the Internet Archive. So who, who are these people? Um, it's orchestrated by the AAP, um, but it's the uh, four of the very largest uh, publishers in the world, one owned by Rupert Murdoch. There's other uh, large monopoly, multi-billion dollar corporations that are coming after the Internet Archive for fundamentally what we've been trying to do is buy electronic books, buy electronic books in the same sense we used to buy books in the past. So we'd buy an electric book and then we'd be able to preserve it and lend it out to one reader at a time, right? That's kind of what it used to be in the physical world. Why not in the digital world? They would not allow us or any library to buy an electric book. They're not available at all. So you can't own them. So that's a, a, a puzzle. So we said, okay, let's go back and scan the books that we do physically own, have one copy, and lend it one reader at a time. Been doing this for 10 years. Um, it's been uh, going great. Hundreds of libraries do it. And in the beginning of the pandemic, these publishers sued us uh, to try to stop this practice across the board. So it's a bigger issue than just a little library sort of little lawsuit, uh, as uh, I will try to suggest. Like, for instance, if you want to get into the mind of what these big publishers are doing, Pearson, which is a major textbook company, um, is starting to invest in NFTs as a mechanism of, of killing off the secondary textbook market. So that even though if you've paid them for a textbook in the electronic world, you can't go and sell it to somebody else or give it to somebody else or actually own it in any real sense. So where the uh, wonder of the blockchain was to have um, uh, an artificial scarcity uh, in the digital world, um, we've now allowed also mechanisms of holding on to things uh, past when it was normally released based on being paid 
um, in, the, uh, in the world of books, and we're starting to see that in movies, for instance, or music. If you think about the music you've probably listened to in the last week, you probably don't actually have the MP3s of those. You're just listening to them off of some streaming service that can change at any time. So what does that world look like? Um, it's really problematic, um, and at least we have some friends. So there was a recent uh, a letter signed by 300 uh, over 300 authors. It's now up to 850 authors. Uh, Neil Gaiman, uh, a bunch of other very famous authors, uh, to basically say that this lawsuit against the Internet Archive and libraries in general is a problem. But the, I, this is not, again, restricted to just uh, a library uh, issue. So, digital ownership is what's at issue and it's what's being formed now and this community could really help um, if we uh, work together to try to understand what does this mean? How much role can people have on an ever-going basis forever uh, to be able to say what it is you can do and how much can they retract at the end of the day. So let me just say a little bit about the Internet Archive. I'm going to just flash through a bunch of big numbers to just say, gosh, isn't it impressive? But to give you kind of an idea of the, what the Internet Archive is, which you may only know of as the Wayback Machine, but it's a bunch of other things too. We have 790,000 software titles, many of which are, are uh, uh, emulatable, so you can go and do your old Oregon Trail uh, days or whatever it is, your favorite video games on old platforms uh, out there. We have uh, over 5 million moving images that people have uploaded. Uh, this isn't even counting television um, that uh, are available, lectures and, and the like, on archive.org, a nonprofit library. Uh, audio recordings, 14 million of them, including uh, 280,000 concert recordings um, uh, from bands that uh, agree to, to uh, share sort of in that non-commercial uh, kind of cre Creative Commons ways. Uh, so the Internet Archive has lots of these and people are uploading more all the time. Um, we have about two million hours of television news, so you can search what people said, which has been very important. We're, it's not just United States television news, we also now have Russian Ukrainian news that's being useful to find out what, the, uh, what different populations are getting fed by uh, the large media companies. Um, and we have about six million books that we've digitized, uh, one page at a time, um, that are available for free, for lending, and a lot of web pages. We're probably best known for the Wayback Machine, but we've got uh, over 99 petabytes of data. I just love this number because it's just kind of ridiculously large. Um, uh, and so we're going to break through 100, uh, 100 petabytes and have a party. Um, so we've also been pioneering this idea of the decentralized web by going and promoting a values-oriented next-generation web where it's a peer-to-peer -peer backend on the web, the, the file coin, the storage, uh, uh, are, are, are sort of the parts of this that we're trying to build, build a better, uh, better internet. Uh, best known for the Wayback Machine, we've got 700 billion web pages and a lot. But what happens when corporations license rather than selling digital things? And we, we've got troubles with the right to repair. We have, you know, people that own tractors, they can't repair them because they're under a license agreement. Um, you know, what does it mean to own anything in this digital world? What happens when corporations license and sell things? Um, well, they get to hold on to them forever. So they get to basically be able to reach onto your device and pull it back. I guess the most uh, dramatic of these is when Amazon came out with the Kindle. Um, why would you call a book reader something that has to do with fire? But anyway, um, uh, book, uh, their book reader, they bundled 1984 onto it and distributed it. Well, the family of George Orwell objected, and so Amazon went onto everybody's Kindles and took it off. I mean, 1984 happened to 1984. Um, so is this happening? Yes, um, it, it, it is happening. So they get to hold on things forever. They can decide what can be done with it um, and these issues forever. They can say who can get access to what, when, and they can change anything about uh, what it is that you can see. They can take it away, um, and uh, this, is, this is happening. Um, what if you can't buy one and only lease 
digital books, then every reading event is permissioned. So anytime you turn a page, somebody is controlling what it is you see and whether you can see it. And it can be completely individualized. So the pages can be tracked. They can change the books at any time. They can deliver different books to different people, and you might not ever know it. And corporations and governments can change history. They can just make things go away. No amount of digital currency, magic, or uh, changes to copyright law will stop this. It's the magic of licenses. It oversteps all of that. Um, the publishers have manipulated copyright law to last way too long and cover all sorts of things. But at least it was under rule of law. But when you're under rule of contract, they can go and set whatever terms they want. Um, and there will be fewer and fewer publishers, which is happening. They're consolidating and becoming platforms. So they're not interested in protocols, they're interested in platforms. Um, so where we have a typically um, now sort of, we're, we're trained to go and say, oh, bad Google, bad uh, Twitter, bad Facebook. Um, it's true, those, are, those organizations should uh, reform. But there are, there's these organizations that are behind the curtains owned by some of the very richest people in the, in the world that control not a lot of what it is we see, what gets published, and that structure. And they are getting stronger and bigger uh, all the time. So, is it happening? I mean, you know, we hear a lot of scare things about, you know, this and that, and the answer is, well, uh, yes. Um, and will it continue to happen? I would suggest yes, unless we win our lawsuit. So our book's disappearing. So just two weeks ago, Wiley, which is a major educational publisher that had been selling these database products, remember you can't actually buy the eBooks, you can just rent them if you're a library, um, and then uh, they were being assigned in classrooms, and then they took down 1,200 of them and just made them poof, go away, right? So yes, can they go and take books away on scale? Yes, are they? Yes. Um, are they watching every page? Yes. Um, in fact, um, they're proud of it. So Amazon is proud of being able to count all of the pages that you might read in some particular book and go and change how they compensate people upstream. The Authors Guild, which is a trade association very closely allied with the publishers as opposed to authors, um, has been pressured and they were very proud that they pressured Amazon to spy even more on users such that if you flipped too many pages in a book that you had bought, that you couldn't return it for money with Amazon that they thought this was a huge victory um, to spy more on readers. Um, so we've got some uh, incentives um, not, not going right. But I'm just trying to demonstrate, yes, there are real problems going on. Are, is book banning going on? Yes, at scale. I mean, there seems to be a com competition in the United States between the states to go and say how much banning can they do? And that is a pride in one of the parties in the, uh, uh, in the United States to go and go and uh, surface and, and constrict more um, of what people can see in the library system. So there's libraries can't buy things, they can't, uh, and they're starting to get rules by governments to take them out. What libraries do is they buy, preserve, and lend. They buy books from publishers and it compensates authors this way. Um, they preserve them long term and they make them available and then they also um, lend them one reader at a time. What the publishers are saying is you're not allowed to buy, you're not allowed to preserve and you're not allowed to lend in the electronic world. This con con makes a, uh, a shifting sands that's kind of supposed to be the antithetical to what we've been building in the decentralized world where you actually know that you actually have those coins or whatever. But we're seeing some of these contracts be able to be used for exactly the flip opposite. Right? I, it's a little deja vu for me. I'm an old guy that did a lot in the early internet. Internet Hall of Fame, uh, the system of publishing before the, uh, before the web called Waze. I, I, so I've seen a lot of this go through. I've seen a lot of the promises go through. I've seen a lot of the dreams get twisted 
by extremely powerful players to play against exactly the things we set out to do in the first place. So think about it hard um, as we're building some of these systems because it's going on now. So what should we do? What, what's sort of the, you know, okay, that's a little doom and gloom, Brewster. Um, got any suggestions? Well, yeah, let's go and get the next generation publishers Let's, get, let's buy books from them, and let's publish your books with them. Um, so when you're trying to go and get it, your next book uh, out there, go with one of these presses. They sell the libraries. And, um, and Vitalik's book, um, the Proof of Stake book, it's on Seven Stories Press. And I visited them, and they gave me a, a, a preprint uh, before it was published uh, a, a edition of it, which is just great. But these um, are some of the indie publishers. I would say indie publishers should be independent of the big behemoths, and they should, just like in the indie music world, go and do something differently of supporting the authors more and supporting libraries more. So these, at least, are, are ones that are, are selling. Support antitrust. Um, the, the idea that these organizations can get so large, it can make it so that it doesn't even matter um, if uh, there are uh, anti-censorship rules. If a few, only a few book publishers get to go and say who gets compensated to make books available at all, or who's on the major television news channels like Fox, then you can bend the discussion just from that. So let's keep the organization small, Cory Doctorow, uh, and Rachel have been uh, uh, very uh, cogent on this point um, and something to do. And support the Internet Archive and other libraries that own collections. That should be something that you're conscious of. Hopefully out of this, it's just digital ownership is something that uh, really needs to be protected, not just for libraries, but the Internet as a library. As we're going into the decentralized web, if we cannot make copies and put them in different places, we are sunk. The way that the world worked before the web is publishers, um, writ large, all sorts of publishers, would go and, and sell things. It would be bought by individuals and libraries, and they would go and hold on to it and make it available. And even if one library burned down, it would still be available. If the publisher went away, um, it would still be available. If it went out of print, which they do all the time, uh, it would still be uh, available. Um, this is not the way the web works. It's on one server, and if it's changed on that one server by that one organization, they assert the right to go and change it forever and for always. This doesn't make any sense. Um, so the decentralized web was to try to bring a peer-to-peer -peer back, back end back to the uh, information ecology um, to make a, a a uh, healthier uh, uh, world. So that's the uh, uh, the uh, the hope, and, and um, please engineer some of your systems um, into building uh, uh, a better web. Thank you very much. I think we have time for a few questions, if at all. Otherwise, you get some more time back. If you stand up, it might help the volunteers get you a mic quicker. So I read about an effort uh, the Internet Archive was making to curate um, the Wayback Machine and curate snapshots of websites to include, um, you know, some flags for fake news or misinformation. Um, can, can you talk more about that? Or, yes. Uh, so the that? Internet Archive collects lots and lots of web pages. Um, and tries to get everything that's publicly available. But not all of it uh, sort of belongs in a library in lots of different ways. Um, for instance, we get people coming back to us with, from their blogs and going and saying, look, you know, that was a blog when I was married to somebody else and I kind of like to not have that be available. So a lot of those get removed from the, uh, from the Wayback Machine. Um, unless they're a famous person. So, for instance, there are some people that are now running for, uh, for political office. We will put those uh, back in, in, in play. Um, there are other things that people have used the Internet Archive as a publishing platform. And we're not a very good thing for that. Um, they might upload a movie um, to go and promote their uh, recruiting of uh, adherents and having close-up violence. Uh, in recruiting of, of 
certain soldiers in their war. Um, we want to have copies of these, but we don't want to be a publishing platform. So we put some speed bumps in the way of making so that it's not just a Twitter click uh, away. YouTube and, and those sorts of things are publishing platforms. We are uh, a library. There's also some uh, uh, things that are not just uh, um, uh, calls for uh, uh, violence, but they're uh, ongoing harassment. Um, so these are, people will write to us and try to have things that are uh, being used as harassment. And we will uh, often put in a speed bump or put some context around it if it's been, been debunked to try to give some context to people. I think that the, the uh, sort of something we've been trying out is the answer to bad speech is more context. To, to give it so that when people see something, they kind of know what's going on. They think of it as the card catalog function of, the, uh, of a library. It's not just to have everything on the shelf uh, uh, Blanket uh, is to go and have things such that you know what it is you're looking at. And some things in the short term um, actually are, are used uh, for um, harassing people to the point of death. Um, and so we're trying to make the balances of these to such that we don't take things completely away. We might just make it so that it's less visible or less visible for a time to try to make it so that, um, I don't know, the bad behavior is not multiplied um, ba based on our um, our efforts. We're we're, uh, we're we're here for the public good. We try to stay uh, with that with that uh, north star. It doesn't mean that everybody agrees with what it is uh, we do, but we try to be uh, transparent, non-commercial uh, about sort of what our decision-making process is in general, if not exactly in every specific uh, specific case. Awesome. Yes. So uh, I hear you when you're talking about uh, we need to decentralize more content distribution to have a more peer-to-peer -peer web. But as you put it yourself, uh, incentive works. And right now, there is not a strong incentive for the distribution of content. Uh, like user, everyone has used a torrent before, I suppose. And there is the infamous. I'm having a little hard time understanding. Oh, sorry, too fast. So. I suppose everyone in here has used torrents before, right? And torrents comes with a problem of seed versus leech ratio. Mm -hmm. And if you want to uh, propose a more decentralized web for the distribution of content, uh, there need to be an incentive for uh, the seeder to provide data to the leecher independently of the content of the data. And what blockchain does currently in cryptocurrencies is uh, they incentivize block production, but not necessarily content distribution to the user. And how would you solve, in a decentralized fashion, the incentivization of content distribution? Right now, it's centralized by lawyers and these big corporations, like, oh, you're not allowed to distribute my content. But at the end of the day, they only have as much power as the law. And if you have someone that don't respect this law, like, I don't know, like someone in Russia does not really respect Western law, let's say. And you could have content that is banned in the West being distributed by a Russian node. And, but right now, in Torrance, there is no incentive for this Russian node to give you uh, this uh, data. So how would you go around incentivizing data distribution in a decentralized fashion, which means rewarding data distribution regardless of the content of the data? I could only understand a small amount of that. Let me see if I, I'm going to say something back to see if, if, if it's basically right. How do you incentivize people to go and do content production in, in a world where things can be pirated endlessly? No. no. So I think the question was, how do you incentivize uh, content distribution? Am I correct? Content correct. distribution. Correct. Uh, anonymous content distribution, regardless of the data. Right now, there is no incentive to seed data to other people outside of goodwill. You're not getting paid to give, you, to give someone data, uh, regardless of the data. Like in peer-to-peer -peer internet, uh, you have no incentive as a seeder to give data to other people. How would you solve that? So it's more of like, a, how do you solve the incentivization like structure in order to have like more incentivization for people to um, give the data, like give the... Right. Yeah. So there, there, there's been a long bit of work to try to get open access to work. Basically, writer pays, you know, government uh, created materials, which is great, but it doesn't... Uh, uh, solve everything. So how do we get people paid uh, by going and making 
materials and then distributing on the internet? Without getting lawyers involved, yes. So you'd, the law, uh, the consequence of the laws have been centralization by big platforms. Yeah. So this means you need a protocol solution to get around the law. Like yes. Bitcoin did not wait for the US government to create digital money. And you need the same kind of thing to happen, to have your internet of peer-to-peer -peer content. So they're saying that the lawyers actually present like a point of centralization then? And so sure. how do you incentivize it without the lawyers involved to set up um, like a peer-to-peer -peer structure? It, not everything is solved. Let's start with that. So it's, it's an, there's open questions, especially in the digital arrangement. I like looking at history as sort of when did things work well? And there were periods of time when basically there was royalty structure for large-scale production, distribution, sales um, of say, books or music in a physical form. Um, a lot of that has not translated forward. Um, some better or for worse, um, uh, we've seen a lot more centralization. I think that we can have a many-to-many-to-many -to -many -to -many protocol system, as you point out, not a platform uh, system. Uh, we're attempting to do such a thing with book server um, by going and making it so you can sell and lend books over the internet. Um, and be able to actually buy them. Could there be piracy? Absolutely. But let's make a system that actually works for people. Um, and fortunately, there's enough money around. The, in the United States, there's $12 billion a year just spent on the library system. Three or four billion of that goes to publishers' products. It's about 20% of all the trade books. Let's go and spend that money as well as we can to build a system that works for more than just a few big publishers. Um, and so, do we have the solutions in the digital world? No, not yet, and hence this, uh, hence this talk. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brewster. Um, I, we're at Thank you time. very much. So, um, I'm